Welcome to Art Thinking Forum 2021. I, I'm Hide Ogawa from Art Electronica Future Lab. I'm very happy to welcome you to this annual conference forum together with Hakoro. I'm here in Linz at Yokkaiyu, Johannes Kepler University, and uh, around 2 p.m. here in Linz. And the outside is a really wonderful weather on Sunday. And actually, today is the final day of the festival. So in this conference, uh, I would like to invite you uh, on a journey to discuss what's the latest, uh, uh, latest uh, situation of art, what is the role of art in the 21st century, and how can we apply the art for a better future society. Art creates creative questions and design creates the creative solutions. Art is a catalyst for shaping a better future society, a way to open up new perspectives, encourage curiosity to look at what is behind the scenes, and to stimulate creative solutions. Art thinking is a process of applying artistic thinking and, and Art, art, art through view to a broader range of challenges. This Art Thinking Forum aims to discuss such really art thinking, but this year we are focusing on doing. Uh, together with Hakoro, which is Japanese communication design company, we have established this uh, platform to exchange know-how and uh, new hints for practicing art into our society. As you might realize, uh, on the website, there are some video links. Uh, it's for art as journalism, art as compass, art as catalyst. Actually, they are uh, crystallization from today's wonderful guests uh, regarding their insights for each uh, kind of uh, topic. Uh, how you know, art can be functioned for our society. Please take a look uh, if you didn't check it. So then, I would like to introduce today's wonderful guests from all over the world. Uh, as I mentioned, they are not just thinkers, they are really doing. So I would say they are activists to act for urgent issues that we humans are facing. Of course, during the pandemic and after the pandemic, you know, everybody had uh, many you know, difficult times. But uh, today, uh, I would like to get also from you know, our part, you know, uh, local participants and also from you know, wonderful guests, we would like to really get to the point about how to act for our future. So first, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, one by one, and uh, I'm going to start to discuss today's quite intensive point, though. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce uh, Karen Palmer. So welcome, Karen. She's a storyteller from the future. Her immersive film experience combines AI immersive storytelling, behavioral psychology, and uh, parkour. Uh, to me, the encounter with you and your words really art project, uh, Perception I.O. Uh, I think it was uh, from Stats Award, and it was a fantastic piece to ask me and also audience, oh, am I so biased? Bias is such a strong point uh, this year's also big discussion. I felt really a lot of projects to discuss about the bias. And also you were the, uh, thank you for your contribution pre-jury uh, of artificial intelligence and the life art this year, 2021. You have a lot of insights how, you know, uh, artists, creators are trying to deal with the new meaning of life and also intelligence, right? So just a quick question to you uh, as including introduction. You uh, get uh, a kind of mission to answer to uh, what are your insights about art as journalism. And uh, connecting to that, uh, in this biased society, 
how can we trust information and even myself? Because this year, <laughs> to be honest, I, I constantly ask, oh, am I biased? Or, you know, looking at many projects, so many things, so many projects deal with bias. So in this biased society, how can we trust information and even me, <laughs> myself? <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you for the questions. I'll answer the second one first. And thank you for inviting me here today. It is truly an honor. Um, bias. So my, my perception I owe was looking at different perspectives and perceptions of reality. And perception, the definition is that it's interpretation of information coming in through your sensors. And your sensors are your eyes and ears. And then what happens, the information floods in, and then your brain determines the reasoning or logic or interpretation is applied to it. So in that kind of logical perspective, there is really only a subjective reality that mm. we live in. Every, nothing is really objective. You just have your own personal opinions and beliefs and you filter them through your eyes and ears and you discern your own reality. Mm. What we can seek to do is um, understand each other and mm. understand each other's perspectives. Uh, so what I tend to do is to kind of answer your question on bias and can we trust ourselves and information is that I do several things and I also my work aim to do several things is to kind of encourage you to understand and know your own subconscious mm -hmm. biases the most. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't know yourself, how can I then come to you? And if you don't know yourself and have greater understanding. Mm. So to give that insight to yourself so that you know your own biases, mm. so that you can walk and go, hey, I'm biased about this, I'm biased about this. Bias is like, sometimes that's gonna save our lives having those bias. They're mm. based upon real things that may have happened to us. Mm. We can't just discard them. Mm. So. It's important to know yourself and also be a, for other people to take that responsibility to know themselves. And then and that's themselves in the outside world, I'd suggest you just do your own research when it comes to information. Mm -hmm. When you read something, an article, that's coming through the lens of somebody's own unique bias and information that they've researched. And if you research something else, you can find more information. Like mm -hmm. information is um, erroneous text. Perception is much deeper than that. That mm -hmm. gives you that layer of understanding and insight. Mm -hmm. So I would urge people to expand their perception of reality yeah. to then give them a greater context in terms of information. Yeah, super. And I, I can't remember your first question, yeah. but I've probably used my time anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So thank you, uh, uh, and uh, Karen. And uh, definitely the point insights are one of the basis of today's discussion. Because, you know, uh, actually, I didn't realize much that uh, how we live in the society full of bias. And uh, we realize during the pandemic, oh, everything is in a way virtual. You know, human created such a system. And we trust, we develop the you know, social trust uh, through the histories. But it's a nice time to rethink about the fundamental trust and also the fact that we are living in such a complexity. And connecting to this biased aspect, I would like to next uh, introduce Dominic Chen. Hello, Dominic. Welcome to our, this uh, session. Uh, he is an uh, associate uh, professor at Waseda University uh, School of Culture, Media, and Society. He has been uh, active in promoting the Creative Commons license and uh, in, in between you and me, uh, quite often we exchange, you know, uh, in person, okay, what's the new project, what's the new situations in, uh, you know, Japan and uh, everywhere all over the world. And uh, I, I was recently super impressed about your new exhibition, translation exhibition for understanding misunderstanding, you know, connecting to current part, you know. We are living in such, you know, uh, kind of complexity uh, that uh, uh, biased society, but uh, understanding, misunderstanding, <laughs> it's a very interesting point. And also, you were so uh, researching about the meaning of uh, literature, you know? So literature gives us a really stop to think, and it's a very rich time, you know, uh, in, or even in our times. So uh, you 
have the also agenda as art as compass uh, for creating you know, the video, and uh, maybe later the audience could check uh, all outcomes from artists and also uh, the participant here. So hate, populism, and uh, other new divides are emerging now. Uh, how can we overcome them? So do, if you have any ideas, uh, this question uh, it would be great to uh, uh, connect also your uh, insights about art as a compass. Mm -hmm. Would you tell us about your ideas? Thank you very much, Hide, and, and thank you uh, so much for this inv you know, invitation. I'm, I'm really honored to. Um, yes, uh, that's quite a big question you threw at me uh, so, sorry, <laughs> from the from beginning. beginning. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but I think uh, to answer to the theme uh, I was given for this uh, opportunity, so art as compass, so, so that question um, assumes there is a direction, there's a certain direction we want to uh, aspire for, right? And um, so which direction? And I was thinking through my uh, activities that, uh, you know, um, so how we can um, mature ourselves as humanity, uh, both, you know, um, uh, intellectually and also emotionally. And I think what Karen just said about bias and to understand our own bias uh, also is also deeply uh, related to this question. Um, so, you know, it's, it's very easy today to divide and to divide yourself, uh, you know, to, to take a certain position and to strengthen the position with strong expressions and words and discourses. Uh, and, you know, that kind of uh, attitude uh, can give you a certain uh, assurance uh, because, you know, uh, it, it, can it, it can position yourself in a certain map, right? Mm -hmm. But I think compass uh, uh, includes this idea to always fluctuate inside a map that that is constantly moving. So so the map is is never fixed, right? Today, so instead of taking position or to express the position to strengthen the the division between yourself and the, and the others, I think it's really important today to understand what you don't understand, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, including, you know, your political opponents, your or your, you know, uh, or, or the people uh, you, you don't uh, always share the, the, the same value with. Mm -hmm. um, so through my activities, I'm trying to find a way to construct this affective uh, relationship between, you know, people who don't necessarily always agree on things, uh, and also to to try to understand bias or, you know, uh, a certain uh, imperfection of ourself as a, a positive opportunity to, to create a new, new value, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, for instance, uh, I, I'm really interested in, in this question of, um, uh, of uh, curiosity, mm -hmm. because curiosity comes from uh, ignorance also, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and there's bad ignorance and, and, and also there's a good ignorance. So um, how to think of that, um, uh, of that, of that uh, 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 two, two different curiosity, mm -hmm. right? Um, so how we can use digital technology to, uh, to connect ourselves in a better way. Uh, so I think that's the direction I'm, I'm thinking with this theme of art as compass. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you very much. I think uh, compass and the map are completely different, right? Uh, you know, map is in a way when you make make the map already past, but you know, compass is more you know attitude and also you know uh, we can make uh, t uh, go on a journey with the compass and uh, how to make the you know resonance together because everyone has their own compass, right? So we needed to respect about each journey to you know, make the synergy and the crossing. Thank you very much. Then so finally, uh, from a territorial agency, uh, John Parmegino and Sophie Lonskog, welcome to this session. And uh, first of all, congratulations on your uh, Stars Award. It was really amazing work. And this year, of course, uh, your work is one of the symbolic you know, um, uh, inspiration talking about the transformation. 
territorial agency combines contemporary architecture, art, uh, spatial analysis, advocacy, and action to promote comprehensive territorial transformation uh, in the Anthropocene uh, epoch. Uh, their work focusing on the integration of science, architecture, and art in the challenges posed by climate change and as I mentioned, Oceans in Transformation uh, got to the grand prize uh, in the Stats Artistic Exploration. And uh, your uh, mission uh, before joining to this was to think about uh, what the you know, art as catalyst. Uh, uh, my question, since you have a very clear agenda as uh, climate crisis, what deep, deep issues uh, should, we, sh should we address, except your area? Because you have already special focus, except the ocean and also uh, those uh, points. Uh, if you have any uh, the other your concerns, first, I would like to know. <laughs> uh, and uh, how can we inspire action on the issue? Uh, would you tell us? Uh, you are a little, little bit, maybe, you might have, you know, next project. <laughs> hey, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, it's a real honor to be uh, on the panel with Dominic and Karen. It's really amazing. And uh, thanks for the invitation. Um, what shall we address about um, the next urgent thing? I think that the uh, when uh, we were looking at uh, the oceans, one of the things that we started as architects was to understand sea level rise. And uh, we did a very simple model. And if you know it much better than I do. Uh, but the idea was like, a, no, we're not really uh, acquainted with the, all the dynamics of the ocean. So we thought the sea will just rise like a bathtub. And uh, it's much more dynamic and more complex and violent than that. But uh, the interesting thing is that uh, if we are all good boys and girls, and this is something that I've been repeating a lot, if we're all good boys and girls, and we do manage to decarbonize our societies in the next 30 years, there will be and meet the Paris goal uh, of uh, two, the Paris Agreement goal of two degrees uh, warming above pre industrial levels. There will be still so much added energy to the earth mm -hmm. and kept in by greenhouse uh, effect that the glaciers uh, of uh, Antarctica and the Greenland might. This be completely destroyed, but even without taking that in consideration, the oceans will expand so much that they will cover areas that are now inhabited by one and a half billion people. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we've done in the last 30 years so much. We've created so much. We've created the internet. We've created the uh, rapid urbanization. We transformed entire societies. We brought uh, in incredible uh, capacity to exit, poverty, famine, and uh, we are now in a situation where we're experiencing through the pandemic a rapid oscillation of our uh, world system, and we are in a complete sort of hiccup of all of that acceleration. Mm -hmm. But if that is something that we've done in the last 30 years, mm -hmm. we've got 30 years in the future where we can decarbonize our societies. And our little uh, contribution to this is to focus on the most sensitive component mm -hmm. of the earth, mm -hmm. where life interacts with the dynamics of the planet in a uh, most uh, incredible ways. Mm -hmm. And that is the area in between minus 200 meters where there's still photosynthesis under the water to plus 200 meters above water where the majority of the so-called technosphere operates. Mm -hmm. and, but it's also where life really exchanges a lot. And what is interesting is where the technosphere, all the technology uh, and the components that keep humanity alive interacts with the biosphere exactly there. So we say, don't focus too, too big, don't make climate change an issue that is too abstract, focus on what is at hand, what you can see, what you can act on. So that's mm -hmm. our current project. Yeah. And of course, we also uh, kind of advocate to not think only in the modern way, to try to understand that we need to live with this hiccup or this uncertainty and be in the Anthropocene where basically our world system needs to meet the earth system and they need to understand each other together. Yeah, thank you very much. Wow. So, uh, so far, you know, through the introduction and, and also through the answers from uh, artists, uh, I, uh, I think we have the starting points now. 
uh, again, you know, this forum is focusing on the, what's the role of art in 21st century. And uh, today I'm trying to, <laughs> trying to be deeper and deeper, step by step. But a very first easy point, uh, uh, after listening to each you know, uh, uh, kind of statement from each member, uh, I would like to ask you, uh, you know, uh, why is art necessary for the transformation? Uh, but before going to this question, uh, through the uh, art sectonica this year's experience, this is my just personal impression though, there, were, there are two keywords. Uh, through many conferences and also exhibitions uh, from artists. One was bias, <laughs> as I mentioned to Karen. Quite many projects, uh, of course, not just AI bias stuff, but uh, uh, many projects touch the point how our uh, society and ourselves is full of bias. And uh, of course, uh, for uh, understanding bias, Many people discuss, oh, education is important. But, you know, to produce bias, education <laughs> is very super core element, you know, to make the first encounter with, you know, bias. And uh, to me, I was very interested in the way to remap of knowing, you know, after getting the first maybe, you know, uh, knowledge. But anyway, keyword number one was bias. Another key word was care, you know, caring, care. So what, through many artistic explorations, like to communicate with plant and micro, you know, symbiosis, uh, or communicating with uh, remote participants and communicating with robots, many people, uh, many artists are uh, really trying to create the n not just a human-centered, you know, uh, things, but a new dimensions of kind of caring interaction design. Uh, so that's, uh, those two are the, my major findings uh, this year's festival. Unfortunately, you couldn't come to Linz. I wanted to share this, you know, before uh, this session. But uh, maybe th those might be inspiring you to ask you the question, uh, you know, uh, maybe the tendency of bias and the care connected. But uh, f also fundamentally, I'm very interested in how is art necessary for, you know, transformation uh, as well. So, but the, just open discussion here. Uh, maybe I'm going to ask Karen first uh, to open, <laughs> open part. <laughs> so, um... Thank you for allowing me to kick this off. So I would just maybe, having not been in Linz, substitute the word care for service. I feel that as artists and creatives that we are in service to the community, to, um, it's our responsibility to mm. make the world as best as it can possibly be. It's not, I'm not gonna look for a politician to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, that's our responsibility. Mm -hmm. And it's for us as artists and storytellers to galvanize the people so that they can be a part of this process. Mm -hmm. So as, as my title, The Storyteller from the Future, I talk about that in the future, we use storytelling as a tool of liberation and artists imagine these future worlds and they work with communities to build these solutions, these open source solutions mm -hmm. and these new networks and new communities. It's, uh, that's what imagination is there for, is to create new worlds. And in terms of storytelling, the, per the origin, if you go back to the origins of storytelling with mythology, it was to crystallize and cultivate and spark in people a kind of rites of passage for change. It wasn't really what it's kind of been reduced to now, which is like Netflix and chill. You know, my work is the antipathy of that. I want you to realize that you are a, a, a vital component of this major story that we call reality. Mm -hmm. And my work is to inspire you to be a lead protagonist in mm -hmm. this this reality. And mm -hmm. that's what my storytelling experiences do. Mm -hmm. And that's what my craft of storytelling is, is to enable people to imagine future realities and galvanize us to create it together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, the storytelling can be like a new artistic journalism that the conventional journalism can't catch up now, because uh, that's a very unique point. And uh, I'm going to ask also uh, Dominique, 
uh, what, why is you know, art necessary for transformation? Because uh, you said in the last meeting, uh, I'm not artist, but you are kind of uh, you know, catalyzing and creating the chemistries uh, with the other you know, uh, researchers and also uh, different sectors together. Uh, I would like to know about your impression and also, uh, you know, your um, yeah, know-how, how, you know, why, you know, is art necessary for the transformation? Yeah, um, I, I told Karen and Hide that I, 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 I didn't consider myself as an artist because uh, what I specialize is uh, um, academic uh, studies. Uh, but I also collaborate a lot with artists. So uh, I directed and curated exhibitions with artists and designers and engineers and so on. Um, so why do I think art is an important tool for change and transformation? Um, I think the current situation we're living now is a point that this uh, assumption that, you know, this, this is the um, assumption of uh, this era we call the mo mo modernity. And also we, we all know that we, um, we have entered postmodernity since like 40 years ago, but uh, I don't think uh, this um, mo modernistic way of thinking hasn't ended. And it's, it's also um, haunting in a way still today. Uh, is that uh, th this assumption um, presumes that we could one day become all um, rationally intelligent enough to uh, agree on social issues and you know all, all the environmental problems. Um, but what the internet and you know all the social networks uh, have revealed so far is quite the opposite. Um, I personally feel we are getting more, more and more stupid. <laughs> and, uh, I'm very sad to say that. Um, but in a way, so, so, so this is a good opportunity to think differently, you know, to, to leave this assumption that uh, this um, rational inter intelligence will lead us to a better future. And I think that's the point where I, I really agree with Karen mm. is storytelling is art for me. So that's why in my video, I talked about uh, the most ancient art form, which is storytelling, right? Mm -hmm. uh, starting from uh, mythology, religious mythology, mm -hmm. uh, ethnic mythology. Uh, so, so that's all storytelling uh, that uh, try to weave the, the connection between human and nature and human and the world, right? Mm -hmm. And I think still think that power of storytelling is is more and more uh important today mm. because in this time we are not getting any more intelligent uh, but we know that uh we can be affected by other people's story mm. and and that's why you know uh, art is the most important tool mm. uh, we have to learn and we have to teach our children uh to build a better future yeah yeah, yeah. Right, and uh, traditionally, like a history, for example, is a typical single storyline, but uh, uh, between Karin and uh, Dominic mentioned is how to appreciate the Maruchi lines, you know, going together to, you know, uh, open yes. the time, you know. Then the access by art can be horizontal, you know, access. At the same time, what if you, what if me, you know, these kind of, you know, connections and open up the, you know, 360 degrees, uh, a very powerful, you know, role of art. That's really beautiful. Then, so definitely I'm going to ask John and Anna as well, because you are very in, our, in front of serious, also political, you know, discourses. And uh, uh, you both are from architecture background and creating immersive environment in a way as a storytelling and uh, many different types of people, you know, citizens and maybe governors or decision maker can dive into the, you know, this massive data visualization uh, that the planet uh, ocean, uh, uh, you know, facing. I I'm very interested in, especially you are also uh, insights, how, you know, you are positioning art, you know, to catalyze such you know, space and also discourses. Why is art necessary for the transformation? 
We tend to think of uh, art uh, as uh, something that we appreciate individually. Uh, somehow the biggest bias, to go back to Karen's uh, uh, point, is this idea that there's an outside world and an inside world of uh, uh, somehow uh, deliberation and uh, intelligence. And uh, this is a, uh, a rather uh, traditional uh, way of understanding aesthetics, is what uh, governs what you perceive. Yeah. And uh, there's a completely different understanding of that, and that is, of course, not only the value judgment of uh, the uh, conditions that you perceive in the outside world, let's say a Kantian or, uh, condition, but there's a very interesting contemporary uh, understanding of aesthetics, and that is that aesthetics, so to say, in particular in the uh, scientific domain, gather around uh, an issue very different uh, passions, very different domains of uh, being troubled and not agreeing with each other about what is moving that troubling condition. And it is really this moment of gathering, of creating a space that uh, brings people together, that I think art uh, is where art is showing its capacity of being contemporary, of being a space of uh, cohabitation. And it's uh, one of the few uh, spaces that are truly democratic, mm -hmm. that are truly uh, democratic in the sense that you have a situation where everybody has the same capacity of understanding mm -hmm. art. There's no uh, necessary uh, precondition in entering an art space. Many people will reject that and say that I don't understand anything. Mm -hmm. uh, this is gibberish to me. I, it's something that I really, uh, I cannot deal with it. I want facts. But the ambiguity of the art space, I think, is really the most important aspect. Mm -hmm. It's where it triggers curiosity. Mm -hmm. It triggers... Uh, I hope also curiosity for others mm -hmm. and other modes of sensing and being, and not only human, but mm -hmm. uh, artificial intelligence, of course, but we hope uh, other ways of thinking with the planet. Mm -hmm. So art is a gathering space. Mm -hmm. Maybe just to add that there is uh, one layer of the images in Ocean in Transformation is the so-called bathtub model that John mentioned at the beginning, where we basically took the elevation uh, model of the globe and we filled it as the bathtub does, filled with water until the Paris Agreement level, sort of projected levels. Mm -hmm. And we were quite saddened with these images and we were simply wondering, what, why were these images not on the tables in mm -hmm. Paris? Yeah, fantastic, yeah. And uh, curiosity was created by artistic experiences. It's really clear. And uh, then let's try to go deeper more, <laughs> not just uh, talking about art. But uh, for the democratized transformation, you know, because the point is not we are waiting for just a transforming by some someone authorities or top-down things, right? So we artists are very uh, curious and also feel, as uh, Karen uh, mentioned, a responsibility, you know, to uh, tackle with those urgent, deep issues, uh, but in uh, different ways, you know, so, because we don't need to follow the traditional approach of centralized, you know, transforming that you know, IT big giant or big com com countries are you know, now st maybe starting or acting you know, for tr under the big umbrella of digital transformation. Okay, let's change you know, transformation, but for what? Then I think you are organizing the totally defined ways, you know, uh, grassroots, but uh, not just grassroots, uh, elevating, as um, uh, Anna mentioned, and, uh, you know, the discussion to be certain really uh, kind of protocol also for sharing in our society. Then um, I think uh, 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 connecting to territorial uh, agencies' activities, you guys are literally uh, creating a new common in a way, new space, democratized uh, public spaces. I, I want to say future commons. You know, commons are not just digital creative commons or physical area, 
but uh, I think you guys are creating future commons as an artist because in our digital society, you know, digitalization, everything is zero or one, yes and no, and the in between, you know, humans lost that, you know, in between something, very important elements. Then I can imagine that, uh, like, we don't know yet because it's new architecture, I would say. The, the, that might be online, that might be hybrid, that might be new tool or new agora that you know, in the church or whatsoever. I, I would say this is a future comment. And I would like to ask you guys, what are the necessary ingredients for such a democratized uh, transformation? You know, uh, how, you know, because you guys are always you know, practicing you know, and, and uh, 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 it's different from centralized and the top-down approach, but I'm sure that every time when you uh, execute your projects in society, you are facing <laughs> many complicated you know, situations. Then, so what are the necessary ingredients for such a democratized transformation? So may I ask, uh, maybe, uh, uh, I think uh, from a territorial uh, agency, you, you might know a lot. <laughs> yeah. oh, wow, <laughs> and this is a, uh, a fantastic question, thank you. Mm. For us, the most important thing is to understand that uh, democracy is not about uh, finding a common de denominator. Uh, it's really uh, making the multiplicity of borders mm -hmm. evident in their making. Uh, the uh, major border, of course, uh, uh, that has been set up by modernity is the distinction between what is uh, uh, alive and what is not alive, uh, which has uh, uh, all the uh, implications in, con in contemporary uh, mobilization of uh, people saying, this life matters, mm -hmm. uh, that life matters. Mm -hmm. How dare you not consider me uh, a human? No? Mm -hmm. and, that distinction is uh, an image distinction. Uh, it is uh, really the root of uh, art at the beginning of modernity that invented a notion of uh, distinguishing a fixed background with uh, a mobile, uh, let's say, animated space in front of it. And it's uh, a damnation of uh, uh, the European art. Mm -hmm. uh, the contemporary forms of um, border construction are really what interests us. You know, architecture is a border technology, mm -hmm. it creates borders and articulates borders. And we think that a contemporary space, in particular one uh, that is a public space, needs to make evident how borders are constructed mm -hmm. uh, in order to create a possible disengagement with those borders and not just surpass them and uh, um, say liberate. Uh, we're not interested in that notion of uh, liberation. We're interested in really understanding how there's a multiplicity of gaps, misunderstandings, mm -hmm. uh, construction of more and more walls um, across uh, different ways of thinking, across different disciplines, across species and across cultures. And that, I think, is um, what uh, we think a contemporary space is, mm -hmm. is, multiplic is a multiplication. Mm -hmm. It's a, where we encounter the multiple forms of power. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, then I want to ask us, Dominic, uh, you maintained the Creative Commons, but what I, I, I'm, I'm going to deepen is not just digital, you know, Creative Commons, but a new meaning of Commons uh, in the next society. And uh, so I think you have also your uh, insights of the, uh, the ingredients and also factors, you know, important factors to create such new, you know, future Commons. Would you tell us uh, your kind of ideas? What's going to be the key factors, important ingredients for creating such new future commons? Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, I, I really agree with what John and uh, Aunt Sophie has just said. Um, so um, I think uh, open source community and creative commons communities are also about uh, multi multiplying borders because, you know, uh, Creative Commons, in a way, uh, try to overcome this binary understanding of copyright and public domain. So it's either you have the full copyright or you don't have anything, right? So it's about creating this spectrum 
uh, space in between those binary uh, ideas of zero or one, right? Um, and I think this uh, spectrum thinking is valid for, 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 for many of the other uh, issues we have today. So, you know, uh, what's the spectrum between being an individual and also being part of a collective? What is the spectrum between being a human being and also uh, being, uh, uh, being part of this greater world of the more, more than human world, right? Mm -hmm. So we don't exist within just one border or, or, or you know, one, one simple definition of what we are. So, so I think the ingredients of thinking about the future commons uh, also includes this transformation uh, that we need to, to, to attain that um, new, new territory, mm -hmm. uh, which is to think ourselves in this spectrum. So, so this is very um, not easy, right? <laughs> yeah, <that's really> <laughs> because uh, again, it's, it's it's really more way more easier mm. to place yourself in a very you know comfort area mm. on a map. But we we really need to learn how to transform ourselves, mm. uh, you know, uh, through our aging, mm. and we and how we can, uh, you know, change our uh, perception throughout aging. Mm. Uh, so that's that's also a very practical uh, issue of, mm. of, of living in, in today's world, right? So, um, and also about future commons, uh, I would like also to kind of interject this idea of the uh, intergenerational equity. Mm. Uh, so as you said, uh, the commons is not only about our generation of, or my generation, it's, it's more about the future uh, mm. of, of the future generation, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm always thinking, especially after the COVID pandemic, I'm, I'm thinking more and more about how to contribute to the future, future generation mm. of my child and, you know, and, and, and my child's children and, mm. and, and so on. Uh, so that's one point of maturity we need to attain. Mm. Uh, but that's not what's been um, reached so far by mm. our current uh, civilization, I think. Yeah. Yeah. But it's a fantastic idea how to envision over generations innovation, <laughs> you, know, you know, beyond the, my, not just my generation, the next generation, next, you know, if we can have such initiative, uh, of course, you know, uh, the uh, deep issues are not being solved quickly and uh, so I think that's a very important uh, insight to uh, uh, really uh, make the energy, uh, sorry, synergy together. And uh, I, I can imagine this might be one of the uh, hint for radical abundance, you know, uh, in, the, in the future because we didn't think much about this kind of abundance. Then so new concept of not just the space and the things, but rather I would say new currency, you know. Currency means not just money, but like a flow of something. A uh, new concept of currency might be drastically changing the capitalism, you know, concept and also the territory, you know, uh, defined by the physical, you know, uh, kind of uh, uh, yeah, limitations. But uh, I just uh, jump to also current super interesting initiative of the uh, Hack the Future Lab. I, I, when I heard about this, because I, I, since I'm a di directing Future Lab, I thought, oh, you are hacking my <laughs> Future Lab, but uh, it was completely different. And it is a new, in a way, initiative to um, in, discuss and open the process for uh, democratized transformation. I'm very interested in how you are thinking about what the systems are needed for the deep issue, deep and urgent challenges ahead. Maybe you have already the example as uh, also same uh, as uh, uh, territorial agency though, but just tell us uh, what's your idea, what systems are needed for the deep and urgent challenges ahead? Oh wow, well how long have you got? <laughs> <laughs> so um, on my in my Hack the Future Labs, when I brought together, it, it's like action and think tanks under the umbrella of art um, with the disciplines of interdisciplinary art, tech, neuroscience, um, techno activism, social justice, um, parkour philosophy mm -hmm. about moving through fear, 
film, um, AI tech, and we're looking to create um, new future narratives, not from some abstract arty thing, but mm -hmm. from the perspective of, if we want to achieve this in the future, what do we need to do today to achieve that? What stories do we need to tell ourselves? What do we need to create? What paradigms of belief systems and realities to do that today, to reach that tomorrow? Mm -hmm. So I developed these initiatives, having worked with other amazing individuals, I wanted to come under my umbrella and bring these people like Ruha Benjamin, mm -hmm. I'm a professor and expert in bias and AI, and mm -hmm. um, Bo Lotto, an international expert in neuroscientist, to come and you know, really find these answers. Um, so just leading up to this before, I kind of was looking at open source tech and I made my work available open source with my AI solutions. Also, uh, my current project, um, Consensus Gentium, I've put made art more democratic because I'm putting it on a mobile device so that people can interact with that. Um, it's that they don't have to go to a gallery or a museum. They can actually just do it in the palm of their hand. Mm -hmm. But with the um, Hack the Future Labs, we kind of discerned what, whatever the question was, the answer was always revolution. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, but it wasn't like, hey, let's fight the system. It was more that if we want to create some kind of a change, we need to cultivate new systems. Mm -hmm. Because traditionally, if you look at something like um, the um, French Revolution, they just took off the, the monarchy, cut off the head, but the system continues. Mm. So we have to create new systems so that when we are in that time of overthrow or new systems, we don't look around like, what do we do next? We've already cultivated those in our communities. Mm -hmm. And we have those not even on standby, but already flourishing. And that's what I'm using my imagination for. And then I create these experiences to show them these things. Mm -hmm. So one example of those may be when we were looking in the labs, we did, um, we did the first lab was Hack the Self. Mm -hmm. That was based in the UK and that was looking at it from neuroscience, parkour and spirituality. The second lab was Hack the System. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was done in Netherlands because it has a strong tradition of um, social research. And I was working with VARG and the new institute. And the third lab was how to hack the tech because once you can hack yourself and hack the system, you can easily hack a piece of technology, right? Mm -hmm. And at the second lab was where a lot of things came up, which was the solution which I'm gonna share with you was um, with the technology and the, the coding at the moment, mm -hmm. it's very based on a very Western left brain kind of mm -hmm. um, and like male kind of white kind of form of coding. Mm -hmm. And it, where it's going at the moment is um, often this technology is being used for maybe by the government and by state mm -hmm. in terms of surveillance and, um, you know, more, con more con technocratic. Mm -hmm. And we said, you know, as people of color and looking at our tradition and our indigenous cultures, you know, what what would we use technology for, you know? And then in that case, how would we build it? We wouldn't even use that language. And Kambale, the techno activist who's um, um, in the Congo said, you know, we would like to rebuild the, the tech from scratch. We don't even want to use English language. Mm -hmm. It's based on colonization, mm -hmm. all of it. What the, the, the kind of the paradigm of it is based upon colonization. That's why the extension of it mm -hmm. into technology reflects that. We need mm -hmm. to start from scratch and build our own code from mm -hmm. an Afrocentric perspective to reflect how we would like to use it as a people, as a community, as a culture. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yes, yes, yes. So that's what we're gonna be doing in the next one is that we're going straight back to the roots of technology yeah. and look at what we want to use it for and then that will influence how we build it. Yeah. Yeah, we, we talked to do tank, you know, not just think tank and do tank, or, yes, you know, in mate, different yes, types yes, we're uh, urgently we're ne needed. And yes. uh, just uh, one very nice example, actually yesterday I met uh, Rashim uh, Fan Hadeji, who won the uh, pre Tonica by a Father's Lullaby project. Actually, uh, in Boston, she did artist, artist in government. You know, she stayed in the mayor's office can you imagine that? It, it, I was so uh, amazed because artists in residence everywhere, artists in science, you know, laboratory, oh, it's kind of popular, but artists in mayor's office are really frontline to detect and uh, she uh, has a freedom to you know, uh, get the insights and uh, really express the curiosity, invite discourses. Uh, it's all about a new system, you know, how art can be you know, encountered with such 
really social, deep issues. Uh, I think the next uh, very important mission, I think, in our society. But uh, coming back to uh, territorial agency, I, I would say you are, ag again, the very uh, front line <laughs> you know, for the difficult challenges uh, constantly. I, uh, I, I would like to know about, uh, some, if you say one word, what, what's the most difficult issue now, you know, when you are you know, uh, expanding your activities from uh, the level to be more big movement and policy make, what's the missing elements? Would you tell us about the point? Ah, it's a no-brainer. It's peace. We need peace. We need to abolish war. Mm -hmm. We need to uh, really get together. And uh, you know, the abolishment of slavery uh, was uh, a sea change. And now we look uh, at slavery as you know, how could they even think that that was something uh, human? And uh, we need to do this very quickly and abolish war. But uh, the difficulty is that we don't recognize mm -hmm. contemporary forms of war. We've uh, imagined that the end of the Cold War uh, was uh, a fizzling out of uh, war, and sometimes it flares up uh, like on 9-11, 20 years ago, and then becomes a sort of uh, uh, war everywhere. The point is that we went from uh, the Cold War into, straight into the Warm War, and we need a climate peace. We need really to think uh, carefully about how we engage with a gigantic uh, redistribution and the uh, New Deal mm -hmm. in order to understand maybe what Karen was saying, a new system mm -hmm. that is based on peace. We need to abolish war. We need peace. Mm -hmm. And it's not a wishful thinking. Uh, I think it really has to do with uh, engaging uh, very clearly with uh, the capacity of understanding that we live in a world where we disagree on everything. Mm -hmm. We really disagree on everything. And there's no overarching Pax Americana uh, that is going to uh, cover everything up mm. with uh, an idea, an ideal of, say, low intensity. We need uh, to engage with peace daily. Mm. We need to make peace uh, yeah. daily. And yeah. we need peacemakers. Yeah. And uh, from your activities, I feel not this is a system by, you know, box or architecture you know, the investment, rather I feel humans, you know. I think what you are creating uh, in a way, new concept of like a human infrastructure, you know, to mm -hmm. accept, you know, the uh, also social changes and also to connect the idea for the future. Maybe Dominic, uh, I would like to ask you, uh, actually time is quite <laughs> unfortunate. I wanna really continue several hours more. To <laughs> but uh, unfortunately, the time <laughs> is getting tight. Concerning the human infrastructure, you know, like uh, since you are facilitating many community, you know, not just, you know, physical, you know, you know execution or making new laboratory or building or this kind of stuff, but you are facilitating such, you know, uh, human infrastructure. Do you have any uh, your ideas? What's the point uh, creation of human infrastructure uh, in 21st century? Um, I, I really agree with uh, what John and Anne Sophie are doing, and I think that's a really beautiful way to connect, reconnect human and nature into one system. You know. Um, because, uh, as I said earlier, um, it's, I think it's more important to find a way to reconnect the affective aspects mm -hmm. of human and the world we are um, surrounded with. Um, so, for instance, you talked about care, right, Hide? Yeah. And, and, and I think care is such a curious notion, mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm trying to read as many papers and books about care um care discussions in in academia started with the with, with the feministic uh, discussion uh since the uh end of the 20th century um and i'm trying to think of care uh for the um for, for the natural environment also mm -hmm. so i'm creating this uh, system 
that enable us to communicate with the microbes mm -hmm. uh, that we are surrounded with, especially in the fermented foods, mm -hmm. because I love uh, making fermented foods. They are so delicious yeah. <laughs> and they give me so much health. Yeah. So yeah. I, I, I started to begin this affective connection with the microbes I'm touching mm -hmm. every day. And I'm trying to give them voices mm -hmm. through using AI and other technology. Mm -hmm. and, and that's one way to create affective uh, relationship between human and the invisible uh, beings that are the microbes. Yeah. And I think the, the same idea flows somehow with the territorial agencies work, right? Mm -hmm. Because the, the, the Gaia system, the, mm -hmm. the earth system is mm -hmm. such a, is so huge. It's, it's, it's invisible to us. Mm -hmm. We can only detect by numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we, we are kind of biased here too. Yeah. We were biased to process all the data about the earth, about the climate change, about the global warming, but we, we shouldn't process only with the, our, you know, uh, with our uh, kind of intelligent brain, but we, we also have to use our emotional brain mm. in, in relation with the earth and the, in the ocean. Yeah. So um, I, mean, it, uh, I, I think human infrastructure yeah. uh, that you talked includes that aspect a lot. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, so I want to continue this discussion, but as the time is over, I, I would, as you say, you know, now it's time that uh, to shift, not discussing climate change, but climate care. You know, this kind of you know, combination uh, is very important. So we should take care. <laughs> you know, we should care about all things in many uh, deep issues. Then how to act for tomorrow is that I hope today, you know, unfortunately I couldn't have time to get your QA, but I hope you got the insights, what's the role of art uh, for next society and what's the important factors. Let's care about our planet and our, our individual. Thank you very much. See you in the next program. Thank you uh, all mem uh, participants. <laughs>
These digital experiences are modern mythology simulations of rites of passage. Prime must no longer be passive observers in the narrative in the same way we can no longer be a passive observer in the narrative of our life. My immersive experience via made the participant conscious of their subconscious fear. I just did the riot experience and it was awesome. It was so fascinating. I'm studying to be a psychologist and I thought that this would revolutionize how we see and interact with the world around us. Then Perception IO made the participant aware of their own potential implicit bias. For me, the value of artistic expression lies in its power to provide us perspective to become others. Since the age of mythology and epic poetry, literally works have enabled us to imagine the lived experience of others who are different from us and it evokes another life that we could have experienced. Literature can also become a compass to find a way out from our own bubbles. Humans live in an innate filter bubble without even being connected to the internet. Depending on the conditions of our birth and upbringing, the values of the people around us, we can easily live unaware of the diversity of perspectives available to us. I believe that literature allows us to get out of such a bubble, imaginatively and creatively, to feel, empathize, and approach the lives of people we have never met. This is why I have been working to create opportunities to gain perspectives to become others using artistic expression and design methodologies. Let me introduce some of my activities. In the installation work, Last Words, Type Trace, which I created with artist Takumi Endo for the IG Triennale 2019, more than 2,000 people answered the question, if you were to disappear from the world in 10 minutes, who would you leave a message for? The text, showing the process of more than 2,000 people who repeatedly stagnate write and erase 
and confront the finitude of their own lives, all resonate directly with the reader, like literally words, evoking a life different from the one they have lived. By looking at the dynamic process of writing, rather than the static text, there is room to better imagine the intentionality of the writer. Today we are still at the mercy of the power of words, and social networking services seem to be destroying the democratic assumption that we can understand each other if we communicate rationally. Strong voices that incite confrontation and division are gaining more and more influence, and we are frequently unable to understand each other even in situations where we should be able to. On the other hand, why don't we think of ourselves as inherently unable to understand each other? Even if we speak the same language, we cannot understand each other fully. If we think about it that way, I think we can recognize the value of the process of trying to understand each other. Following this idea, I directed the exhibition Translations, Understanding, Misunderstanding, held at 2121 Design Site, where I also took part in the creation of some of the works. In the artist Pei Ying Lin's video work, Unspeakableness, Personalized Language, she asked multilingual people to mix up all the languages they speak to write a text using the words they like best in each language and read it out loud. I participated in her work and read out the director's message for the exhibition in my own French, Japanese, English, and Chinese words. This is a message that can only be understood in its entirety by someone who understands all these languages. But the text is much more nuanced and expansive than if I had written it in only one language. Normalement, quand on parle de la traduction, we refer to a situation in which a le langage de kakareta, spoken words, or dans d'autres langages, need transform. However, hitotsu no langage de kotoba hasuru, process itself can be considered in sorte de traduction. And in found in translation, an installation work I created in collaboration with Google Creative Lab and Studio The Green Eye. We designed an experience that allows visitors to experience the algorithmic world of Google Translate and be showered with multiple languages. Normally, machine translation is used for one-to-one -one translation. But in this work, when you utter a single word, it is translated into 23 different languages and returned to you as audio. When looking at a technological advancement, one might think as if all languages would one day become translatable reciprocally. But we should never forget that there are languages in the world that can never be accurately translated and that our thoughts and perceptions are also diverse thanks to this untranslatability. Based on the idea of linguistic relativism, which states that each language has its own way of perceiving the world, this work makes you realize that your words are potentially connected to a multitude of different languages around the world, but at the same time each language has its own world, or Umwelt. I am also working to communicate with non-human beings, I like to grow fermented foods, and I want to know how the fermenting microorganisms feel. So I am researching and developing a robot called NukaBot that translates their status into human language. Hey, Nuka. An interesting finding of this project is that Talking to microbes on a daily basis can increase our attachment to them. The theme of building a relationship of mutual care with the most inscrutable of living organisms, the microbes, can also be a compass for us to break free of our anthropocentrism through our relationship with the Earth's soil, other natural entities, and more than human worlds.
Territorial Agency is an independent organization that combines contemporary architecture, art, technology, science, spatial analysis to advocate and act towards integrated territorial transformations. Our focus is in building capacity to act on the complex challenges of the Anthropocene. We work on architecture, the relation between polities and the material spaces of operation. It is a rapidly shifting relation with uh, both collective forms body politics and the structure and spaces we shape undergoing complex transformations. They have shaped the magnitude of human spaces through incredible acceleration that has now impacted the dynamics of the earth. Art thinking is for us a way of engaging different groups, individuals, organizations and institutions to reimagine the distributed agencies they operate in and depend on. We live in a world shaped by a multiplicity of forces acting simultaneously. A territorial agency, we devise aesthetic structures to form and give shape to public assemblies, where different ways of conceiving a space are simultaneously presented together. We shape spaces for diplomatic encounters between different ways of knowing, different modes of uh, being, different concepts of the contemporary. We operate public diplomacy as an arrangement where different researchers, institutions, groups and individuals set out simultaneously different visions, where the values need to be renegotiated in order to be held in common. Oceans in Transformation is a research into the contemporary impact of humans on the ocean. We ask how to become sensitive to the multiple changes that are modifying the global ocean how to encounter the many modes of thinking it, and how to form new ways to collaborate in order to safeguard the main source of life of the planet. The relations between the atmosphere, the land and the ocean are being radically altered by the intensification of these human activities. The rise of the Anthropocene epoch cuts across pre-existing territories. It reshapes boundaries, reconfigures long-term inhabitation forms and modes of being. Together with scientists and artists, we investigate how these disruptions are modeling different ways of knowing and being with the ocean. Oceans in Transformation addresses the contemporary transformations of the ocean by building complex dynamic images from oceanic scientific data sets. The oceans are still largely unknown. And the difficult and complex event of the scientific knowledge of climate change is bringing more and more efforts to understand their dynamics. Remote sensing, voice, multi-beam sonar sounding, GPS tracking of animals, multi-year detection of geophysical parameters, complex circulation computational models are now being, beginning to form a new image of the ocean. The project is organized through a series of uh, tangent lines that cross uh, the different oceans and encounter along their trajectories a number of uh, transformation processes. They are transformation processes of long-term inhabitation of different human populations in of the oceans and they are the tipping elements of the contemporary earth system. We intersect along these tangent lines a number of uh, different and adjacent processes, a number of different epistemes, a number of different ways of thinking, a number of uh, a growing uh, insecurity about what is happening to the ocean. The ocean is a sensorium. It records the transformations of the Earth in its complex dynamics, and it inscribes back its cycles in the evolutions and adaptations of life forms. The global ocean is changing its circulation, energy, interactions, and ecology. It is the most dynamic and sensitive component of our living planet, yet the most unknown.